This is John Tolson, and this message uh, you'll be listening to was first given on uh, September the 28th at a gathering of men luncheon. So unfortunately, it did not get recorded at that time, and we've had requests for this to uh, be re-recorded, so that's what we're doing. So let's have a prayer, and we'll begin. So Father, help us to uh, listen with um, very focused uh, attention to what we'll be talking about today. And may we not only gain more insight and wisdom and uh, information, but be motivated to do what your Bible is teaching us, especially in the times in which we live now. In Jesus' name, amen. So the question we're dealing with is, why is our country going downhill? Well, here's the answer. Because people are broken. When people are broken, they're going to go downhill. The health of the country will be based upon the health of the people. Now, let me give you a few observations as we begin today. Uh, We are living, first of all, observation one, under divine judgment. And so if you look at uh, Genesis chapter number three, beginning with verse number 14, uh, you'll see the consequences of what happened when Adam and Eve, God's first people that he made, set in a perfect environment, had all their needs met, set up one rule to protect them and to honor him, and they broke it. So here here are the repercussions. And what we're saying is, again, we are under, we are living under divine judgment. Genesis 3. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread till the return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, and for dust you are and to dust you shall return. And so as we look at this today, the first thing I want us to see is we in our country and on the planet, according to the Bible, are under the judgment of God, all of humanity. Not a good place to be, but it's a reality. Observation number two, God is not, excuse me, let me start over. God is in charge, we are not. Is God done a lousy job? Why didn't he turn things around? Well, the president's not in charge. The Congress is not in charge. The Senate's not in charge. Uh, The string pullers behind the scenes are not in charge. God is in charge. A lot of people don't think he's in charge. Let me tell you, he's in charge, whether you like it or not or know it or not. Observation number three, the issue of absolute truth. Francis Schaeffer, a man I studied under in Switzerland years ago, said this back in the early 1970s. He said, in the United States, the issue will be at the turn of the century is, is there any such thing as absolute truth? Well, my dear friends, there isn't. Less, way less than 50% of the people in our country believe there's any such thing as absolute truth, and especially as it applies to the Bible. And that is, that's the deal. So a state of theology uh, survey was done by Legionnaire Ministries and also Lifeway Publishers, and this is some recent information. Two-thirds of the United States evangelicals 
These are people who believe the Bible's true, that you need to know Christ and have a relationship to him to go to heaven, etc. Two thirds of e- evangelicals now believe that humans are born in a state of innocence. In other words, there's no sin. No sin in them, no sin factor. Well, this is absolutely diametrically opposed to what the Bible teaches. For example, in Psalm 51, verse 5, it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. So you can see if we weren't if we were, didn't have sin or weren't or, or were born in a state of innocence, that's contrary to what the scripture says right here. Or if you look over to um, Romans 5.12, the scripture says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. So uh, 35% disagree with that, though, of evangelicals. 35% do believe we entered with a sin factor in our human nature. Listen, we are not sinners because we sin. Rather, we sin because we are sinners. And in this state of theology study and survey about the Bible, Christians, a number of people in the United States that claim to be Christians, only 25% say the Bible is true. Only 25%. So uh, that is the state of of absolute truth. And you can see where this whole thing is crumbling around us how people live, lack of morals, lack of respect for one another, lack of respect for themselves, on and on. Another thing we need to understand is, under this whole idea of absolute truth, um, there are basically only two anthropological views. View one is that man is basically good with a proclivity towards evil. Man's basically good with a proclivity for evil. I'm not sure if you've heard the story about the frog and the scorpion, uh, but uh, one day uh, they were on the side of a swollen river, and the scorpion said, I sure would like to get across that river, so could you, Mr. Frog, uh, can I ride on your back? The frog said, are you crazy? If you ride on my back, you will sting me and kill me. The scorpion said, don't be silly. If I killed you, it would kill me too. We both go down and drown. The frog said, well, that makes sense. Get on my back. So they started across the river, and about halfway across, the scorpion stung the frog. Just as they were going down for the final time, the frog said, I knew it. I knew it. I knew you would sting me. And the scorpion said, I didn't really mean to. It's just my nature. Moral of the story, before you do business with a scorpion, make sure you know something about the scorpion's nature. So that's the first of the two anthropological views. The second view is that man is basically evil with a proclivity for good. Man is basically evil with a proclivity towards good. In Psalm 14, verses 1 through 3, we read the following. They are corrupt, talking about human beings. They have done abominable things and works. There's none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. They have all turned aside. They've together become corrupt. There is none of those who does good. No, not even one. So the question is, why is our country broken? Answer, because people are broken. So the question even beyond that is, How did people get broken? We've got to understand these basic things. If you go back to Genesis 3 in your Bible, and those first people disobeyed a holy God, and as a result of that, there is sick, human, sinful nature. That is the deal. Now, now we're going to take a little deeper dive in the scripture to understand why we're on the spiral road. Any doctor will tell you that in order to help a person uh, with whatever they're ailing with, you've got to have a good diagnosis. If we're going to understand the culture in which we live, we have to have an accurate diagnosis. This is critical. 
So I'm going to go now to Romans chapter number 1, and we're going to begin with verse 18. It starts out, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's verse 1. Let's look at this first key word, the wrath of God. Now, this word wrath comes from a Greek word called orge, from which we get the English word orgy. You might know what that means. The point is, God is not just irritated. He is angry with a passion. He is angry that mankind has chosen to disobey him and to go their own way. Now, you say, well, I don't, I mean, God, if he's a loving God, he can be angry. You better believe it. Listen, it is most appropriate for a holy God and righteous God to be moved to anger against evil. You don't put up with evil if you're a holy God. So let me, let me ask you a question. Are you moved to anger towards evil in our day and time? How about in your life? How about in the world in which you and I live? Does it bring you to that point? Listen, a judge with no distaste for evil would not be a good judge. In verse 18, it goes on to say, and mentions two terms, it says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. So there are the two terms, ungodliness and unrighteousness. These two terms basically cover a multitude of sins. But Paul, the Apostle Paul, who is delivering the message here under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, has in mind not a whole bunch of sins, but one universal sin committed by all humans. What is the sin? It tells us right in the verse. For those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Those who suppress the truth. That's where his anger, his righteous anger is coming from. So what does the word suppress mean? Well, it means to hinder, to to stifle, to incarcerate, to put in detention, to obscure, to repress. You know, maybe you've seen these big coils on trucks or in factories, and if you took a coil and you tried to mash the coil down, uh, it could be so strong and uh, built in such a way that it's almost impossible to push down just with a hand. But let's say you pushed it down a little bit. Eventually, you're going to wear out because you're not going to be able to keep it down very long. And the second thing is, when you take your hand off, the coil is going to pop back up. It's going to spring back up. So, in the same way, by nature, we take the truth of God and press it down. We force it into our subconscious. But we cannot uh, ever get rid of it. It always, like the coil, keeps springing back. So we need to understand that. Um, Now, as we look on down past that, verse 19, he says, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Now, this is a key verse. It's not referring here to the Bible truth, but truth apart from the Bible. It's talking about truth in what has been made in creation and in the universe. Uh, So the word manifest in verse 19 means to show plainly, not to obscure. It's not some secret knowledge that only intellectual elites can know about. Uh, In the the New Testament, there were a group of people called the Gnostics, and they believed in Gnosticism, that you had to have the inside knowledge to really be able to have any kind of a, a relationship with the God of the universe. So what it's saying here is, if go back to verse number 19, it says, uh, because what may be known of God is already manifest in them, for God has shown it. And then if you eke on down to verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. So what it's saying here is, there is enough information that a person in Bula Bula land can understand that someone who's never heard Uh, a great preacher from America, uh, share the gospel, the good news of Christ. Uh, They've never read a Bible, 
but there is enough in what they observe around them to give them clear, a clear sense that something is behind all of what is created. It's interesting, just a little sidebar here. Uh, the, the Greek uh, agnosis uh, means without knowledge. The uh, agnostic portrays himself as a less militant form of atheist. The atheist boldly declares there is no God. But the agnostic says, I don't know if there's no God. I'm, agnos- I'm an agnosis. I am without sufficient knowledge to make a firm judgment on the matter. Incidentally, by the way, the Latin term for agnosis is ignoramus. Woo. But anyway, agnostics think they are not as militant as atheists, but they do not realize that their agnosticism exposes them to greater risk for the wrath of God than if they were militant atheists. Not only do they refuse to acknowledge the God who reveals himself plainly, but they blame God for their situation, saying he has not given them sufficient evidence. Ah, a friend of mine, R.C. Sproul, one of the great minds of the last 75 years in our country and world, said I was invited to a university campus several years ago to speak to an atheist club. They asked me to present the intellectual case for the existence of God. So I went through my arguments, and towards the end of the lecture, I said, I'm giving you arguments for the existence of God, but I feel like I'm carrying coals to Newcastle because I have to tell you that I do not have to prove to you that God exists because I think you already know he does. Your problem is not that you do not know that God exists. Your problem is that you despise the God whom you know exists. Your problem is not intellectual, it is moral. You hate God. The scripture is saying here that what has been known of God is clearly seen. We open our eyes, we observe the universe, we observe the particular details on this planet. It is clearly seen. Something is behind it all. The question has been asked for years. Uh, How about the poor, innocent native? They haven't heard uh, a great preacher from America. They haven't heard or been able to read the Bible or somebody read it to them. What's going to happen? Are they going to make heaven? Yes, they're going to go straight to heaven. They don't need a Savior. Fact is, what we need to understand, dear friends, there are no innocent, innocent natives. There are no innocent people. No innocent people. Jesus came to die for sinners. We're all guilty before a holy God. The scripture says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we need to understand that all, no one will make heaven apart from Jesus. No one will make heaven apart from him. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He's not a way, he's the way. So again, in verse number 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So every human, according to that verse, knows of God. Every person needs a Savior, on the other hand. So what can be known about God? Well, according to verse 20, first of all, we can all know whether we read or re- ever read a Bible or not, God exists. Somebody, somebody's behind this. We might not use the word God, but we know some entity is behind all this. God's eternal power, his immutability, that means his character, never changes. His omniscience, he knows all. His omnipresent, he's present in all time and space. So all these and more are things that can be known by every human being on the planet. And as a result of that, it says in verse number 20 that because of that, what can be seen, what God has made manifest, we are without excuse. We have no excuse. And so the day of judgment, when it comes, I can almost hear somebody saying, but Lord, I didn't know you for for real God, I didn't know you were there. There's no excuse, my dear friends, for ignorance. No excuse. And so, in verse 21, we move ahead a little bit. Because when they're without excuse, 
although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So it says, first of all, they knew God. They knew he was there. But they did not glorify or honor him or, or as God or were thankful. Listen, a fundamental sin of the human race is idolatry. And that is the sin of refusing to honor God as he is. We want a God we can shape and mold, that we can live with, that we can control, that we can define, that we can manipulate, that we, be, we can be comfortable with. We don't want a God of wrath. Well, the God of the Bible, dear friends, is angry at sin and evil. He is a just God, a righteous God, a holy God. He's also a loving God, a gracious God, a compassionate God, a forgiving God, and on and on the list goes. But then in verse 21 again, it says they became futile in their thoughts. The word futile basically means incapable of producing any useful result. In other words, it's pointless. Their thinking is pointless. Listen, all of man's faculties uh, are a part of this futility, but also when it says their foolish hearts were darkened, the word heart is referring to the mind, the will, and the emotion, all of our faculties. So we're further enslaved to sin as a result of the futility of our minds and the darkness of our hearts. Listen to this. Spiritual darkness and moral perversity are inseparable. So what's the effect? Moral judgment, intellect, and reasoning powers are all screwed up. Again, Psalm 14.1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool. Denying what you know to be true and saying it's not true. The word fool here means stupid or wicked. It's where we get the word moron or moronic. And so when the heart is darkened and the mind is futile and we have no sense of moral judgment, uh, intellect and reasoning power, we're in uh, for an analysis of being broken. That's, that is a diagnosis. Verse 23, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. So in other words, they repressed the truth, but the memory they had, or we have today, is not destroyed. They exchanged what they knew of God for something they can live with. They formed all these wooden metal, or whatever they made them out of, these idols, these deaf and dumb and ridiculous idols. There's nothing, listen, There's nothing more terrifying to a sinner than God. So make your own God, who's less threatening, who is less intimidating. Now, as we've read that and seen the downward spiral, I want to end up the talk by looking at what were the results, what were the consequences of this downhill slide. And dear friends, these consequences you, if you wanted to put a date on them, you could put 2022 right now. This is what's going on. But what you need to know is where the things going on today came from. And I just gave you where they came from. Romans chapter number 1, verses 18 to 23. Now let's look at the consequences. And all I'm going to do is read a few verses to give you what the Bible says. These men uh, deliberately forfeited the truth of God and accepted a lie, paying homage and giving service to the creature instead of the creator, who alone is worthy to be worshipped forever and ever. God, therefore, gave them up or handed them over to disgraceful passions. Their women exchanged the normal practices of sexual intercourse for something which is abnormal and unnatural. Similarly, the men 
turning from natural intercourse with women, were swept into lustful passions for one another. Men with men performing these shameful horrors, receiving, of course, in their own personalities, the consequences of sexual perversity. Moreover, since they consider themselves too high and mighty to acknowledge God, he allowed them to become the slaves of their degenerate minds and to perform unmentionable deeds. They became filled with wickedness, rottenness, greed, malice. Their minds uh, became filled with, uh, again, wickedness, rottenness, and greed. Their minds became steeped in envy, murder, quarrelsomeness, deceitfulness, and spite. They became whisperers behind doors, stabbers in the back, God-haters. They overflowed with insolent pride and boastfulness, and their minds teemed with diabolic invention. They scoffed at duty to parents. They mocked at learning, recognized no obligations of honor, lost all natural affection, and had no use for mercy. More than this, being well aware of God's pronouncement that all who do these things deserve to die, they not only continued their own practices, but did not hesitate to give their thorough approval to others who did the same. I tell you what, that is a depressing uh, set of verses, which in a nutshell tells you, tells you in October the 17th, 2022, where we are in the United States of America today and in this world. So the question comes, is there any hope? Well, before I read you the hope, I'm going to read you one more time that we are under judgment in our country. John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son, Jesus, shall not see life, but the wrath of God still abides on that person. So every person that you know, and maybe you'll be listening to this, that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that have never asked him in their life, that person right now lives under the wrath of God. And what will happen to people who remain under the wrath of God is they will be eternally separated from this holy God that sent his precious son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose from the dead for your benefit. It's not going to end well for the people that have the wrath of God abiding upon them. So where's the hope? Well, that was John 3.36. Now go back a few verses to John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Put your name in that. For God so loved Jim, or Pete, or Sally, or Sue. For God so loved the world, you, that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him, trusts him with their life, receives him into their life, will live forever, will not be separated from him. So um, you need to know the truth. You've, You've seen, we've explored the diagnosis, and we've seen the consequences of the life of a person that does not have a relationship with the living Lord Jesus Christ. I pray you'll ask him to come in your life. If you don't know know him, why don't you do that right now as you listen to this? Just say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. Clean me up. And from this day forward, help me to become the man or the woman you've always wanted me to be. In Jesus' name, amen.